This Airbus A310 was on its third attempt to land at Surat Thani Airport in Thailand. On the previous two attempts, the crew had been unable to find the runway. This was their last chance, otherwise they would have to return to Bangkok. The crew becomes so focused on landing that they fail to see that the aircraft has now entered a stall. What the crew do next only makes the situation much worse. To see what happened and why, stay tuned. On the 11th of December 1998, this Airbus A310, belonging to Thai Airways International, was on a scheduled passenger flight to Surat Thani Airport. The flight had originated in Bangkok International Airport and on the aircraft there were two flight crew, 12 cabin crew and 132 passengers on board. For the flight crew, the pilot's total flying hours were 10,167 with 3,088 on type. For the co-pilot, his total flying hours were 2,839 with 983 on type but 1,605 on a similar type aircraft. Before departing Bangkok International Airport, the crew received weather forecasts for their trip. The weather forecast for between 1 in the afternoon and 10 at night was variable wind at a velocity of 8 knots with a visibility of 7,000 meters, rain showers with low cloud at 1,800 feet and overcast at 11,000 feet. They also received a further forecast for temporary weather during that same time period and it was variable surface wind with a velocity of 15 knots gusting to 25 knots with the visibility of 1,500 meters, rain showers, low cloud at 1,200 feet, broken cloud at 2,000 feet and overcast at 11,000 feet. It's worth noting at this point that Thai Airways policy for landing at Surat Thani Airport the visibility couldn't be less than 2,200 meters. The crew opted to continue with the trip even with the forecast temporary weather as for the majority of the time the visibility was looking to be greater than that at 7,000 meters. As well as the weather information the crew also received several NOTAMs. Now NOTAM stands for Notice to Airmen and these are notices to four aircraft pilots of potential hazards along their flight route or at their location that could affect the flight. So in this situation, the crew were informed that the instrument landing system, or ILS, at Surat Thani Airport was unserviceable. Along with that, the Precision Approach Path Indicator, or PAPIs, you might have heard them, is a lighting system either side of the runway to inform the pilots they're on the correct glide path. One of them, on the right-hand side of the runway, was unserviceable at this time. And also, the non-directional radio beacon, or NDB, was also unserviceable during this time. So the crew were aware that the ILS, the NDB, and one set of PAPI lights were unserviceable for their approach. They did still, however, have the VOR DME, and it was this navigational aid that they decided to use. So a VOR DME are actually two separate systems. The VOR, which is actually an acronym within an acronym, stands for Very High Frequency, VHF, Omnidirectional Range so VOR overall. Now the way this system works is it's a radio beacon so it will fire out two separate signals and the aircraft will have an antenna that receives those two signals and can interpret a radial based on that radio beacon. This means that if you have a VOR nearby and you are tuned into their frequency your aircraft will have a pointer that can tell you exactly where that beacon is and then you can use that radial to fly along a track towards or away from that beacon. And the other part, DME, it stands for Distance Measuring Equipment, and this will give you the distance the aircraft is from the beacon. So using the VOR and the DME together, it will give you a position and distance telling you exactly where the aircraft is in relation to the beacon. One thing the VOR DME can't do is provide any vertical guidance. This means that if you're using this for an approach, it will have to be a non-precision approach which means your minimum height that you can descend to will usually be a bit higher than if you were using a precision approach such as an ILS. The way pilots get around this is there will be vertical guidance on the approach plates that will relate to certain points in space relating to the VOR DME. We'll run through those plates later on in this video as they play a major part in this incident. So the time was now 1826 
and the crew were 70 nautical miles away from Surat Tani Airport. The co-pilot then got in touch with the approach controller and they gave them instructions to execute the instrument approach procedures expecting the VOR DME for runway 22. They then gave them an update on the weather and the surface wind was calm with a visibility of 1,500 meters, light rain and a cloud base of 1,800 feet. The minimum visibility was below the company required standard of 2,200 meters, but with the aerodrome still 70 nautical miles away, the crew may be believed that the weather will pass through and the visibility could improve by the time they reach the airfield. So the crew now decided to brief the approach they were going to fly, and they used the approach plates that they had within the cockpit. Now these approach plates were provided by the Flight Route Facility Department of Thai Airways. The problem in this instance is that these plates were created after an instrument approach procedure meeting on the 12th of February 1998. However, they differed from the up-to-date plates on the Aeronautical Information publication of Thailand. Now the differences on their own weren't too catastrophic. They had slightly different tracks and slightly different holds, about 10 degrees different from each other. The difference was compounded due to the visibility issues but also it changed the crew's perception of where they were in the airspace. On the official approach plate, they had them on a track of 204 degrees, but also informed them that the inbound track was offset 16 degrees from the runway centerline. This means that they expected the runway to appear on their right hand side as they were visual with the runway. Whereas the track they were using on their plate was 215, and with the runway on a 225, the runway centerline will be offset much less and it should be expected on the nose or just slightly right of the nose. The reason why this was happening was because the VOR beacon was located on the left hand side of the runway, not at the threshold or before it. Therefore they were flying towards the beacon which was already left of the runway so you'd expect to see it on the right hand side as you were visual. On a day where the weather was good they would see the runway centerline much sooner than when the weather was poor as what they were flying in today. The crew then set the aircraft up for their approach and informed the aerodrome controller that they were over the intermediate fix. The controller then informed him that the Pappy lights on the right hand side of runway 22 were unserviceable and that there was an obstacle 400 meters from runway 22 threshold. The crew continued on their approach and then reported passing the final approach fix. The aerodrome controller informed the pilot that the aircraft was not yet in sight However, they were clear to land on runway 22. Shortly after, the co-pilot reported that the airport was in sight. They then disconnected the autopilot, but realized very quickly that they were not going to be able to turn the aircraft towards the runway in time. They decided to go around. They slowly increased the thrust from 70% N1 to 102% N1. And during the go around, they noticed that there was a high rate of climb. The co-pilot then mentioned it might have been because they were very light and they amended it and continued with their go-around. After the go-around had been made, the controller in the tower asked what distance the pilot saw the runway. The pilot then informed him that it was about three nautical miles from the runway. They also informed the controller that they were left of course, which is the reason why they could not land on the first time. Whilst they were setting themselves up for the next approach, they then asked the controller if it was raining at the airfield, to which he confirmed there was light rain at the airfield. The crew at this point had a discussion and agreed that it might have been because of the wind and rain as why they were pushed slightly left of track and how they found themselves in that position. The crew then informed the controller they were at their final approach fix and again received clearance to land. Both air traffic control and the pilots were not visual with each other. The pilots were again struggling to find the runway. For the second time, they finally saw it as it appeared out of the right hand side of the aircraft. They determined that they were unable to land and they decided to go around it again, this time with the autopilot and auto throttle engaged. During the go around, the crew discussed that the approach was not in line with the runway because the aircraft was not in line with the VOR course. The co pilot also mentioned that he couldn't determine whether a light was one from a boat or from the runway, so they were still unsure where the runway really was in comparison to where their approach track was taking them. The crew then decided that they were going to attempt a third approach. They did discuss that if this was not possible or they failed to land this approach, that they would have to return to Bangkok. 
The co-pilot then worked out the minimum fuels and they still had enough fuel to make an approach and if not, return to Bangkok. The crew then made an announcement to the passengers. They said, ladies and gentlemen, we're unable to land. We have to try again, but if another landing uh, cannot accomplish, we proceed to Bangkok. Thank you. They then informed the controller that they intended to carry out a third approach. The controller informed them that the visibility observed was approximately 1,000 meters. The frustration and pressure was now starting to build in the cockpit, with the two failed attempts to land and a third one being the last before returning to Bangkok. The crew were aware that this would have further impacts on the company. One of the pilots said, We fly back. If not in time, the aircraft won't make it to Chiang Mai. The pressure was really building on this crew to get the aircraft on the ground. When they were informed about the 1,000 meters visibility, the pilots were heard discussing 1,000 meters unable. But the decision was not made at that time to call off the approach and they decided to continue. Still slightly confused on how they got into the position on each of these approaches, they then discussed and confirmed that the runway was on a heading of 225. The co-pilot said that the runway heading was actually 225, but the VOR track was 215. They continued on their approach and then reported to air traffic control that they were at their final approach fix. The air traffic controller then said clear to land runway 22 and then they discussed that they were clear to land we'll try again. They continued to descend until they reached their minimum descent altitude. The captain then said can you see and both the crew were looking out the windows trying to find the runway. The autopilot was then disconnected and they continued to search for the airfield. Leaving the decision as long as they could the pilot then emphasized, cannot land, cannot land, and decided to go around again using the autothrottle. The co-pilot then said, trigger go levers, and the engine power increased from 51% N1 to 102% N1 in 8 seconds. This again caused the nose to pitch up, but because of the speed in which the throttles were brought to 102%, that nose pitch up was a little bit more than the crew was expecting from the previous two go-arounds. Both the crew members were continuing to look out for the runway, and whilst they were looking, the pitch of the aircraft was continuing to increase. The pitch attitude had now reached 18 degrees, when the pilot put a small amount of pressure on the elevator to stop that rate of climb. The crew then were continuing to look for the runway and get distracted and frustrated by the situation, and the pitch then continued to increase. It reached approximately 40 degrees before again, the pilot applied the elevator and reduced the angle to about 33 degrees. Still looking for the runway, that nose attitude increased again to 48 degrees. It was at this point the pilot said, too close, cannot land. And when they checked their instruments, it was a nose up attitude of 48 degrees and an airspeed of less than 100 knots. The aircraft was now in an upset position and very soon entered a stall. The captain then called for climb power and tried to wrestle with the aircraft to get it to pitch down. The request for more power was only increasing the pitch up motion on the aircraft. The captain then called for full power, but this again made the issues worse as it caused the nose to pitch up more, deepening the stall and making it even more unlikely that they were going to recover. The crew continued to try and control the aircraft until at 1908 and 700 meters south of the airport, the aircraft crashed into the ground. Of the 146 crew and passengers on board, 101 were killed, 35 were seriously injured, and 10 suffered minor injuries. In the subsequent investigation that followed this incident, it was determined that the probable cause for this incident was down to a few different factors. The first one being the pilot attempting to approach the airport in lower than minimum visibility, the pilots suffered from an accumulation of stress and were not aware of the situation until the aircraft had entered the upset condition. It was also determined that the pilots had not received adequate recovery training for wide-body aircraft. Airbus had actually sent a document to Thai Airways on the 1st of February 1998. This document highlighted the fact that wide-bodied aircraft with engines under swept-back wings would lead to quite a strong nose-up pitching moment when thrust was put through the engines. This was exaggerated when the aircraft was lighter weight. Thai Airways itself also published an article entitled 
Aerodynamic Principles of Large Airplane Upset, and this was published in November 1998, the month before this incident. The reason this is so important is because this training covered the stall recovery for a high nose stall, and the main difference for aircraft that had underwing mounted engines was that you reduce thrust when you enter that stall. So as we saw with this incident where the captain is asking for more thrust, all that's happening is it's causing the nose to pitch up more, thus increasing the stall. If the crew had received the adequate training, then obviously they would have reduced the thrust and potentially that would have caused the nose to dip enough to recover from the stall. It also couldn't be determined if the stall warning and pitch trim systems had functioned correctly. Due to the high angle of attack that the aircraft had experienced, the pitch trim system should have activated to assist in bringing the nose down. This may have added to the issue as it might not have been functioning correctly. It was also determined that the approach charts that the pilots were using that were issued by Thai Airways were for a trial. And due to the nature of that approach chart, they would actually need a minimum visibility of 4,800 meters to be able to see the runway centerline when it was intercepted on that VOR track. Now the safety recommendations that came out of this incident were that pilots should strictly follow all procedures set forth in the flight operation manuals. Any flight safety documents that the operator has already assured for its safety should be certified by the authority. And that pilots should undergo airplane upset recovery training. That last one's a bit of an understatement. If you're interested in watching any more air crash investigations, check out this playlist here. Thank you for watching this far and I'll see you in the next one.